Special Podcast. After School Special Podcast. After School Special Podcast. After School Special Podcast. Where exactly had Dave Chappelle gone, and why? He'd walked off the set of his self-titled Comedy Central show, leaving behind a multi-million dollar deal. I never believed that he was crazy. Ever, ever, ever. As Dave himself put it, why would I leave America for Africa to get medical attention? I think that's something that the people who are caught up in the Hollywood machine have to say in order to make themselves feel better. Oh, walking with $50 million, that's crazy, he must be nuts. It didn't help matters that Chappelle's own agent, publicist, and writing partner had no idea where he'd gone. His wife didn't even know where he was. Hello, latchkey kids and broken homies. This is the After School Special Podcast. I got Staff Man with us. Yo. This is Double D. This is part two of the Chappelle Show. Please listen to the last episode. We did season one, and... How do you follow up a classic, The Chappelle Show Season 1? For example, yeah. in the music world, like how do you follow up Michael Jackson's Off the Wall, like the album, or Metallica, right. Ride the Lightning, or mm-hmm. a better example for film, like The Godfather 1 or The Terminator 1? This is what Chappelle was facing after a classic Season 1, and it left the audience hungry for more. And as it turns out, Season 2 will not be a disappointment. And before we get back into it, season two and the beginning of the end, actually, of The Chappelle Show, I'll do a little bit of a brief recap from what we talked about from the last episode. And Mm -hmm. we also have a big show announcement for those who actually saw the Instagram Live we did on Friday. You might already know this announcement for those of you who haven't, which is probably 99% of you guys, something happened with our show that is very similar to what happened to Dave Chappelle at the end of his show run. But here we are, season two, after his season one DVD sales broke records. Dave's DVD sales led directly to his $50 million deal with Comedy Central. On the back of Dave Chappelle's incredible DVD sales, Comedy Central offered him an enormous $50 million contract for the third season of his show. Because by the way, after that first season and after the success of the DVD, Dave Chappelle was the hottest comedian in Hollywood. Season two was highly anticipated and this is where we start. But before we do, do you have any initial recollections on season two, like the beginning of it? John, did you have any of those expectations did you think that okay this is probably going to be as good as season one or, or did you have any yeah. expectations well i didn't watch the initial release of season two live oh, what okay. i did was i bought the dvd set one and two mm-hmm. and watched it in succession and i mean season two was phenomenal i mean the music was good the skits were really good I mean, it was just a lot of positive feedback Mm -hmm. from what Chappelle was doing. I mean, you know, you had his critics, but he's a comedian. And what he was doing was, you know, pushing the envelope. You know, he even said in season one, like after the black white supremacist, that this might get me canceled, you know. Right. You know, and he kept pushing the envelope. That skit was like the genesis of what the show became because I think that was one of his first episodes that he wrote with Neil Brennan. And he was like, at the time, like, I can't really do this skit in my stand up act and I can't make a movie out of it. That was the reason I wanted to do the show, that one skit. You have this idea like that, and it's like, what do you do with it? It's not long enough to sustain a movie. You can't make a sitcom about it. There was like, there was like no venue really. 
to get an idea like that off your chest. And a lot of these sketch comedy shows, it's, the sketch is too long for that typically. But that's another thing that Chappelle change when it comes to sketch comedy. Usually sketches they were saying are between like three minutes and five minutes, but that skit alone was like 11 minutes, seven minutes long. It, it didn't seem right. that way, but yeah. it was a long sketch, was, you know, but yeah. So season two begins following a strong first season. The second season of the Chappelle show airs in January of 2004. And during this time, Chappelle had reportedly signed a new contract with Comedy Citro worth $50 million. And like mm -hmm. I said, that was off the strength of season one, the DVD sales, and the show was picked up for two more seasons. So a season three and a season four. But a lot of people, I guess, didn't understand, and me included, he didn't get 50 millions like up front. It's not like Comedy Central wrote him a check for $50 million and handed it to him. The deal could be worth up to $50 million. And most of that money was based upon the assumption of sales of DVDs for the third season and the fourth season that was supposed to be beyond that because it was a two season deal. It was like stipulations yeah. on the promise that you were going to do a season three, the promise that you were going to do a season four, and the promise that those seasons, along with the DVD sales, were going to be successful or as successful as the previous seasons. So he didn't just right. get it up front, but he got picked up for two more seasons for $50 million. So the pressure mm -hmm. was mounting as far as making a successful season two. And as we mentioned in season one or before season one, Dave Chappelle signed a contract giving away his name and his likeness. And mm -hmm. I saw an interview, John, I don't know if you saw this, but 2019, 2020, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit when Dave Chappelle was mad about not having the rights to his name and likeness and how when he was young and he said, I just got a kid, I was broke, and here I am faced with the decision of taking the easy money and getting my show or not and trying mm -hmm. to like retain all my rights and all that. And he said, you know, I just went ahead and signed the contract. And of course, years later, that kind of ended up biting him in the ass. But we're here now, 2004. And the first episode we get from the season two was the racial draft, which was so yes. freaking funny. You know what's cool about being in America? We all mixed up. I'm talking about genetically. We all got a little something in us, right? And then some people is more than others. And that's when we get to arguing. For instance, my wife is Asian, I'm black. And we argue about which half of Tiger Woods is hitting the ball so good. <laughs> Derek Jeter is another guy like that. Halle Berry is somebody else. We have got to stop arguing about who was what. We need to just settle this once and for all. We need to have a draft. That's right, I said it. <laughs> and John, I know you said, because we picked our favorite two episodes of season two, this was mm -hmm. one of your favorites, right? It was. Again, I watched this on DVD, so I did not see it live. But we watched it on DVD, and yeah, the racial draft was funny. So you had your host, which was Bill Burr. So what happens is, during the racial draft, it's set up like the NFL and the NBA. And you have famous entertainers and sports icons and social figures being drafted into what race that people thought they belonged in. Good evening and welcome to the first and maybe only racial draft here in New York City. <laughs> Folks, this is for all the marbles. What happens here will state the racial standing of these Americans once and for all. That's right. And the crowd is here to support their races. Well, Rob, some of the biggest names in sports and in entertainment are on the line tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to see who's going to be drafted by which race. Seated behind me on the stage there are the various representatives, and believe it or not, the blacks have actually won the first pick. Oh wow, that's the first lottery a black person's won in a long time, Billy. Yes, and they'll probably still complain. <laughs> Man, f*** you. And my favorite 
was a tie between Tiger Woods finally being claimed by the African Americans and Wu Tang <laughs> Clan yes. being chosen by the Asian delegation. But the one who stole the show for me was <laughs> Most Deaf as the Black delegation. Oh and my Most God. Deaf, Most Deaf had this really deep, gravelly voice, and he had like a Jerry curl, and he had on his red suit. We in Black delegation. No surprises there, Bob. The richest and most dominant athlete in the world. His father, black, his mother, Thai. Well, it doesn't matter anymore because now he is officially black. Dave, the Asians have got to be upset. And Chappelle was the white delegation. He was the white man for the white delegation. So, you know, Chappelle, when he was white, would have this like pancake makeup on, <laughs> like overly doing it. <laughs> From what I remember, then, John, because he did that character in season one, when remember one of those episodes, Chappelle brought up racial reparations and that guy played yes. that same character, Yeah, played the newscaster announcing the reparations for black people, which is another yeah. funny sketch. But yeah, season yeah. this one too. Yeah, man, it was, and he had this blind wig, and he did that character a few times because he also did the character in the wife swap episode. So yes, 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 yeah, yes. Yeah. So anyway, he walks out on stage and he says, "The white delegation would like to take Colin Powell." And <laughs> but before that happens, the black people are booing him, and he's like, "A white man is talking. Would you calm down?" And then he goes, Ungawa. Ungawa. <laughs> Thank you all. Good afternoon. Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hey, will you cut the malarkey? Okay, I'm talking. There's a white man talking up here. Silencio. Ungawa. I like how this white man is so bilingual. Like, he, he just knows everything. <laughs> yeah. So they got quiet. And he's like, we, the white delegation, are going to take... Colin Powell. What? <laughs> Colin Powell is not white. He's he's not even an eighth white. He's 100% black. Last I heard. Wow, I gotta wonder how the blacks are gonna be taking this one. And the two announcers like, Colin Powell's race isn't even in question. He's not even in the draft. So it looks so serious. It comes up with this question. And the black delegation was like, <laughs> We the black delegation accept the white delegations offer to draft Colin Powell on the condition that they also accept Condoleezza Rice as part of the deal. Oh. 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 Power is yes, you need by white people everywhere. We accept. You got yourself a goddamn deal. Black delegation request Eminem. And then quickly he said, we the black delegation take Eminem. And it's like, oh, like, oh, hold a on a goddamn minute. minute there Rondale. <laughs> you wait a goddamn minute, Rondale. He's like, that's not how this works. And they go back and forth. Oh, and you like, remember what he said? He said, you're talking to the original hustler. Wait a goddamn minute, Rondale. That's not part of the part. Okay. Hustling. All right, well, no hustling me. I'm talking to the ultimate hustler. Don't, you, yeah, don't hustler. try to hustle me. I'm the, I'm the ultimate hustler. And he's like, We'll keep Colin Powell, but you guys can get back. Tell you what, let's make all things fair. We keep Eminem, you get O.J. Simpson. Shut up. And, and he's like, ooh, hot damn. <laughs> <laughs> you remember Chappelle, he looks so disappointed, but Bill Burr and the yeah. other guy, like, did a little uh, white man. Did the finger thing. Yeah, like, <laughs> like hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was that. Lenny Kravitz got claimed by the Jewish delegation. Yes, yes. That's it. Wu-Tang Clan got chosen by the Asian delegation. Oh my God, and, they, and then RZA and the Jizza comes up. The Asian delegation chooses the RZA, the Jizza, the God, Inspector Dex, both states kill up the Wu-Tang Clan. Oh my God, what I have just heard with my own two ears. This is by far the biggest upset of the night. The Chinese delegation pulling a fast one and choosing the entire Wu Tang clan. This is big for us, yo, because we've always been a fan of the kung fu and the Chinese culture and shit. So, yo, it's like bong bong, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Ritha, the Jizza. <laughs> Wu Tang. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> and ODB has changed from O 
old dirty bastard to old dirty Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so that was awesome, dude. So that was my favorite. I thought it was really funny. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, babies, you liking the show? Well, thanks. Leave a five-star rating and a comment, please. Do you want to see the guys' faces? Well, they got YouTube videos. You can watch this podcast on any major platform you listen to. Rate five stars and comment. Thanks, babies. I want to mention an honorable mention, but I want to talk about the dice game because they had the oh. same two guys hosting the dice game. Yes. Um, yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Marcy Projects here in Brooklyn, New York. Why are we here? To buy weed? Not this time, Bill. No, everyone knows we're here for one reason and one reason only. We're here for the 8th Annual World Series of Dice. And Eddie Griffith is in that, known as Grits and Gravy, or... I think it was... it's Grits and Gravy. I'm looking it up now. So, the episode name is called World Series of Dice. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. in that same episode, Paul Mooney did Mooney on the Movies, which was also funny. Yeah. He was doing movie Grits. reviews, and he, he was yeah. giving the black perspective. His shit was hilarious. Yeah, he was like, because he was talking about all these movies. He said, The Last Samurai, starring Tom Cruise. The Last Samurai centers around Tom Cruise, a Civil War veteran who goes to Japan and teaches the Emperor's troops how to fight. Mr. No, Mooney? no. Another movie that I was offended by. The, I mean, Hollywood is crazy. The Last Samurai, starring Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. He's the last samurai. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. That movie was offensive. He said, It doesn't even have the right people in there. I mean, Hollywood is crazy. First they had the Mexican with Brad Pitt, and now they've got the last samurai with Tom Cruise. Well, I've written the film. Maybe they'll maybe they'll produce my film. The Last Nigga on Earth, oh. starring Tom Hanks. How about that? He said, I'm gonna have a movie called The Last Negro on Earth, and it's starring Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, I'm gonna have a movie called The Last Nigga on Earth. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny, dude. It was funny. Paul Mooney, his cadence and how he spoke was funny to me. Which I want to, before we continue, if they're listening, I want to shout out the guys at Sacred Barber because we got two new fans there. Hell yeah. So I was talking about it and they downloaded some of our episodes. So I want to shout those guys out. So thank you to Sacred Barber for listening. I downloaded their podcast because one of the guys does one for the Sacramento Kings. So I oh, live out wow. here and I said I was support them. So yeah. So we'll shout out the podcast. It's called the Kings Herald Podcast. Oh, uh, no doubt. Kings Herald. Thanks for so like and subscribe. It. Oh, I got yeah. another shout out since we're doing shout outs real quick. Person actually rated and subscribed to our show. I don't know who this person is, but one of the things I like to do is shout people out that shout us out. So mm -hmm. thanks to Rose C, the Haitian mama. I don't know who that is, but they wrote a comment and they rated us five stars on Apple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They said this podcast is amazing. I love the topics. The conversations are very engaging and entertaining. Thank you. That was all compliments to well, me. We appreciate not you guys. That. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. my favorite episode was obviously the one that was probably the most popular in the whole series, which was the Rick James yeah. episode starring right. Charlie Murphy and Dave Chappelle as Rick James, the true Hollywood stories. Hollywood's a crazy place. I don't know if you guys know people that work in Hollywood or talk to people. There's a guy that does sketches on our show, Charlie Murphy. He was like Tyree in the mad real world. Yeah. <laughs> That's Eddie Murphy's older brother. A lot of people don't know that. But ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. Charlie Murphy's true Hollywood stories. Was famous, infamous, and the beginning or well, the origins of how that skipped came right. to be everybody probably knows this but for those who don't charlie murphy during taping of the Chappelle show when they would all have lunch so like the actors the crew in between taping yeah. Chappelle, he used to just tell us stories at lunchtime about being in hollywood that was so crazy and he told us one story that was so good we had to have him come here 
and tell it for you guys tonight. One thing led to another, and that's how, in a nutshell, the true Hollywood story skit came to be, and the shit is hilarious. So the Rick James skit comes about, you get Charlie Murphy against the green screen, and not a lot of people know this, but that, they were supposed to put like graphics on the right. green screen, and Neil uh -huh. Brennan said that whenever they tried to do that, it just didn't look right, and they just saw mm -hmm. that the green screen behind Charlie Murphy, it just worked better. But yeah. of course we get the story of how Charlie Murphy hanging out with his famous brother. And if you don't know, it's Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy in the eighties yeah. and how he would just run across all of these stars. Charlie Murphy was in the Navy as Eddie Murphy was blowing up in the eighties. He eventually came back from the military, came back home and became part of Eddie Murphy's entourage. So wherever yeah. Eddie Murphy went, he was there. And if yeah. you look for anybody listening, if you look and watch some of those old videos of Eddie Murphy walking through the crowd, you'll see Charlie Murphy in the background with a greasy ass Jerry curl. And yeah. the Ch Chappelle show did a good job because a lot of the stuff that you see in the Rick James skit is like, that's yeah, that's how Charlie Murphy looked in the eighties. Had that greasy ass Jerry curl. Yeah. We got closer, started hanging out. My brother, didn't do any of this shit. So at night, when Eddie would break out, we would all be doing, getting crazy and wild. And we... The funny thing about that skit to you, John, what was it? All right, so the funniest part for me is when Chappelle comes out dressed as Rick James and he's doing the come to me, the come to Jesus <laughs> fingers, you know, the way. And, what, what Charlie uh, said, I could see his aura. We gonna hang out with Rick James tonight, you know what I'm saying? And here he comes out the room, and I look at him, and I'm not bullshitting, man. I seen like, like an orange, his aura or whatever. I, I seen it. He's orange. That's like I ain't, yeah. I, I ain't give a f about most of the celebrities, but for some reason, I, Rick James, he just had that aura. Yeah. I mean, if Aaron was here, you know, Aaron kicked a lot of ass in his day. So, you know, it was like, a, a, it's a lot of quotable. I hate to be on that train because it's a lot of quotable moments. Hey, but, uh, hey, brother ain't here. So go ahead, John. Yeah, so Talk I mean, your shit. the funny part to me was <laughs> when uh, the real Rick James is there and he's like, I ain't kicked that couch. See, I never just did things just to do them. Come on, I mean, what am I going to do? Just... Just all of a sudden, just jump up and grind my feet on somebody's couch, like it's like it's you know something to do. Come on, I got a little more sense than that. Yeah, I remember grinding my feet on Eddie's couch. You know? <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Oh my God. Okay, you want to talk about the famous catchphrases from that episode? Yeah. Because I mean, for anybody listening, I'm sure you don't really need a synopsis of the episode. It's, yeah. Charlie Murphy talking about his experience of whooping Rick James's ass in real life mm -hmm. because, in his words, he was an habitual line stepper. Habitually, he's a habitual line stepper. He stepped over the line <laughs> habitually. So he habitually, had, yeah. Yeah, habitually. So he had to whoop his ass. And Rick James yeah. said, yeah, you know, Charlie Murphy, he was hanging with the big dogs. You know, I had mm -hmm. to straighten him out. <laughs> a couple of times he was going a little going overboard but like you said charlie murphy said yeah you know rick james came over one time at eddie murphy's house and eddie had this new couch shows up at my brother's house <laughs> nice place nigga so he had these, these dirty cowboy boots on <laughs> pushed this out of the way barged in the house my brother had these brand new couches they were suede it was suede, and as soon as Rick James came in, he came in the wild as hell, and he came in and had these dirty ass black boots, cowboy boots, those little dirty, dirty ass cowboy, cowboy boots, and, we, <laughs> and then we see him stomp on Eddie Murphy's on couch. new couch, and just started grinding mud on his couch, man. Yeah, I remember grinding my feet on Eddie's couch. You remember why you did it? Because Eddie could buy another one. <laughs> Your couch, nigga. <laughs> buy another one, you rich motherfucker. <laughs> Yo, couch, nigga, yo, couch, darknesses, darknesses. And he was like, yo, I had, yo to, I had to whoop this mother legs. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, they should have never gave you, you money. money. And then they, <laughs> but you get a close up of Rick James's yeah. legs. Oh my God. The yeah. When, when they come back to the club, yes. they go back to the club and they meet him and darkness, 
Darkness is coming. Darkness is spreading. The darkness is. The, the and he darkness. used to call Eddie Murphy, or Rick James used to call Eddie Murphy and Charlie Murphy the Darkness Brothers, right? Because of my, my complexion, he used to call me Darkness. He calls me and my brother Darkness. He calls us Darkness Brothers. See, this is long before Wesley Snipes. Back then, we was the blackest <laughs> niggas on the planet, according to this book. And it's both of them brother Darkness. Twin brother Darkness. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he just kept saying darkness. Every yes, darkness, everybody. Yeah. My funny part, which isn't really like a famous part, but when we first see Rick James and he was talking to the two women that was next yeah. to him, and he was just bragging about himself. He I'm one of the baddest motherfuckers of all time. <laughs> one of the best singers, one of the best looking motherfuckers you've ever seen. Hold my drink, bitch. He walk up to any chick, lick the whole side of their face, man. I'm Rick James, bitch. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> like, I, I thought that. Enjoy yourself. I thought that was yeah. so cold. Like, yeah, yeah. enjoy yourself. But the time where Charlie Murphy said, "Yeah, we went to the club," and Rick James, he had this ring, and it was from that song Unity. Unity. And, and it, <laughs> <laughs> he said, as soon as I stepped foot in the club, he punched me with that ring. We walking up into the VIP section and um, I'm looking around to see who's there and looking at the girls and everything. And all of a sudden I heard something go, Tell my Murphy! <laughs> that was cold blood. Unity. He's like, Charlie Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> and then you see the, you see Unity of Charlie Murphy's head. And he was just looking so embarrassed. He was like, Motherfucker thought that shit was so funny i was like i should whoop this guy's ass because the way you said the ghetto size of me man stump this mother out but it's rick james and then we get the yeah. scene where he's like yo i'm gonna get this mother back and he goes to rick james hotel and as soon as he comes in the hotel do some karate kick that sends him flying to the window <laughs> Bow! caught him with the front him telling like he gave me some kind of bruce lee cross kick or something i kicked the shit out of him the wind is knocked out of it. Oh my yeah, god. It, it was the dresser with a mirror on it. Yes. And he's like, ah! <laughs> yeah, he went like eight feet in the air, and then those two security <laughs> guards, he's like, and then he screams out, security! Darkness, now you're in trouble or some shit. He's like, yeah these two security guards about to whoop your ass. It, it was something to that effect. And Charlie Murphy was yeah. like, mother take one more step. I'm kicking this nigga out the mother window. <laughs> Next mother to step up, I'm kicking this out the window or some shit like that. I'm like, oh my God. So yeah. yes, you had Donnell Rawlings in that episode too, as Charlie Murphy's friend. But really the chemistry between Dave Chappelle being Rick James, and Charlie Murphy, and then Charlie Murphy doing that parody of the true Hollywood stories and talking about yeah. it. It yeah. put Chappelle like on a whole another stratosphere. He was already right. famous. The show was already famous, but that pretty much cemented it. And I yeah. know the episode after that, which was the Prince episode, was in my head was equally as good but the thing about it what i wish they would have done john i wish they would have spaced it out a little bit so the rick james episode was season two and the very next episode was the prince episode which was great yeah. but i think the prince episode which is famous it suffered a little bit because it was like right after that i wish yeah, it, it was already in the glow of the rick james episode they should have had a segment called real hollywood stories each episode that way you had something different but yeah i, I would have say saved it to the end but i mean who am i to say i mean <laughs> Chappelle yeah. did quite well the episode did quite well but the rick james episode was my favorite after these messages we'll be right back Hey guys, you can catch this podcast on any major platform you listen to podcasts. Please make sure to rate us five stars and comment on how you're liking the show. After school special podcast. You know, that hard goodness that you get the next day. Oh, yummy. From a day old donut at Dougie's. After school special podcast. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's my childhood right there, motherfucker.
When did yeah. that come out? Podcast comes out every Friday. 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 My second favorite was when Chappelle becomes Black Bush. You know, I've talked about a lot of things on the show. I've made fun of so many different people. And people say, Dave, you talk about everybody except the president. Why didn't you do that? Well, because he's the president. <laughs> now, I know my limits, ladies and gentlemen, and I wouldn't want to cross them. But I will say this. <laughs> if our president were black, we would not be at war right now. Not because a black person wouldn't have done something like that, just because America wouldn't let a black person do something like that without asking them a million questions. You know, they always do polls like minorities just don't seem to trust the government. Because you don't understand what it looks like for us. So let me help paint the picture. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you now, Black Bush. Man, that whole episode, do you remember that episode? Yeah, what, yeah. What he was like? That's when they had that old dude on there. I don't know his name, but he was a bit player on there. The old light skinned dude with the glasses, and he was like, "Look at that yellow cake. That yellow cake there, man. Remember? Oh when, yes, uh, <laughs> that old guy. Oh my god, yeah, what? I can't remember guy. his name off the that, top of my he, head. He's the guy who was in the holla 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 holla. Yo, mama, can I bro holla at you? Holla 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 at you. Holla holla at you. Holla 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 holla. Holla 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 holla. Let me holla. Let me holla at you, bitch. Holla 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 holla. Yes, he was also in another skit when keeping it real goes wrong. Man, that guy was hilarious. And like I said, yeah. my second favorite one of that whole season was the Black Bush when he becomes the black president. And when he was like at the press conference and he was like, man, who said anything about oil? What about people who say you're only interested in the Middle East for oil? What? Huh? Oil? Who said something about oil, bitch? You cooking? <laughs> oh. He said, I'm trying to get over there for that. Oh, 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 We sending bombs over Baghdad. We got a coalition. We talking about, we got stank on you. I got a coalition of the willing. I got 40 nations ready to roll, son. Like who? Who said that? Huh? Huh? Like who? England, Japan's. Sending PlayStations. Thank you, Onia. Said they're willing to drop bombs over Baghdad. Ricky Row is coming. Africa Bambada and the Zulu Nation. It was just hilarious. And yeah. and the guest star in that one was Jamie Foxx playing the black Tony Blair. Oh my god. Yes. Now, if you don't want to take my word for it, why don't you ask Tony Blair? He got a whole nother set of intelligence. What's, what's up, Tony? We don't know much about the same. <laughs> Oh, we can't trust random niggas with things like that, as George so eloquently put it. I'm, I'm with him 100% of the way. We don't know what he has. We don't yeah. know what the n have. Like, yeah. <laughs> 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 he said, yeah, we, we got a whole nother set of intelligence. Why don't you tell him, Tony Blair? He's like, yes, we don't know what the n want. Like, <laughs> wants. And that was the episode where Big Boy performed at the end, yeah. I believe. Yeah, from outcast yeah. what's your mm -hmm. second favorite episode of my that? second favorite was the prince episode i don't know if anyone's ever seen this segment we've done on the show uh charlie murphy's true hollywood stories but if you haven't seen it eddie's older brother charlie works on our show and uh he tells us these crazy stories some of which are so crazy that we have to have him come by and tell them to the crowd so tonight we have for you a brand new True Hollywood story from Charlie Murphy. Yes. And what was funny about the Prince episode was the face that Chappelle's Prince makes when Charlie's like, we're going to call this game the shirts against the blouse. <laughs> <laughs> and he makes that face like. <laughs> <laughs> and, Sh and Charlie Murphy was like, what are you sad for? You see that blouse? Like, mother. <laughs> You, you know, you know, you, you damn sure know you didn't get it from the men's department. You know where you bought that shirt, and it damn sure wasn't the men's department. And they're like, "What happened next?" He's like, "Prince can ball, man." I mean, I kind of learned something that day. Don't they never judge a book by its cover. This cat can ball, man. <laughs> so, so. And he said they came out on the court. He was like, "Yo, they were in the same shit. They were wearing that like they were wearing at the, the club." club. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the funny part yeah. it was like one of the teammates on Prince's team when they would score, he would like pat Darnell Rollins on the ass, and Darnell like, Rollins. Okay. He's yeah. like, I'm not on your team, man. <laughs> Right. And Prince was calling out all these like calls like Computer Blue. Let's run a play. Computer Blue. <laughs> Darling Picky. Ow. Shoot the J. Shoot it! <laughs> yeah. Shoot the J. Shoot it! <laughs> yeah. And then at the and end, he's like, he, like, he's hanging off the rim. <laughs> and then all of a Game. sudden, he takes both hands off and he's just floating. Like, how to. Floats. <laughs> like, Game. Blouses. Blouses. <laughs> So I did read an article from Entertainment Weekly where they interviewed Eddie Murphy to confirm if that story was true. And Eddie was it just so happened to be on Jimmy Fallon, and he said everything that happened was true. From the Rick James, uh, from the Rick James, from the, story. no, from the from the Prince. Oh, the oh, Prince even story. Prince uh, confirmed yes. that too. Prince did too. Yeah. Did you see the episode of Dave Chappelle? Oh yeah. What did, you, what did you think of that thing? Oh, loved it. Loved it. <laughs> that's that's a true story, by the way. Oh, oh uh, the Charlie Murphy story. Oh yeah. That's so real. so he, you guys got together and you guys played play basketball. Oh definitely. And you got game. Oh definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and he don't. And he don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, and be honest, it ain't that I'm that great. He's just so bad. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Did you have pancakes afterwards? Well, I didn't make them, but we had pancakes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I loved it. It was good. Was you know, great. what was cool, too, is Dave came over. He came to one of my shows after, and he's going, did you see the skit? I said, yeah, yeah, come on, sit down. And then um, we're just sitting, chilling. We've been there like two, three hours, whatever. Right. And then out of nowhere, I just said, Dave, want some pancakes? <laughs> <laughs> said, Before describing Prince, very Prince and very non-basketball attire for the showdown, my brother was like, okay, it's going to be shirts against the blouses. Everyone laughs. The blouses won. They beat the shit out of us. We had one dude on our squad, Larry, who could play, and he didn't have no shoes, so Prince gave him some sneakers. And Prince wore like two, three size smaller than Larry, but Larry was so excited to have Prince sneakers on, he put those tiny sneakers on his feet and he couldn't do his game right. So we lost. The one dude who could play, Prince Shoes had shut him down. <laughs> so And of um, course we lost both Prince and Charlie Murphy. And Charlie Murphy. Yeah. We lost Charlie yeah. Murphy in 2017 and we lost Prince in 2000 was 16. Was yeah. That? And the whole thing is is that Chappelle did a wonderful job of conveying how Prince was acting and Chappelle had on this again this makeup that lightened his skin had him looking very Prince like it was just funny <laughs> man the pancake makeup so, yes yeah the pancake makeup it was a little more subdued than when he played the anchorman I will say Chappelle really broke some barriers as far as what a comedian can do oh, yeah. if you open your mind if you know because then you have people like Carlos Mencia who came out who obviously stole from people mind of Mencia uh, well that's more of what we're going to now which is the end so season two mm -hmm. ends with high ratings high critical acclaim and everybody mm -hmm. is just clamoring for Dave Chappelle who mm -hmm. at this point is complaining I'm doing 18 hour days I don't really have time for myself people say all kinds of things they act like if you don't do this show you are going to die this is you know you've got to get this done you've got to it's good you know I mean like all this crazy pressure and you know do you know what happened to you if you blah 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 I saw in interviews where he was like yo this was like a mom and pop store it was me mm -hmm. Neil Brennan and we were right for so many mm -hmm. hours we would the next day do the skit that we wrote and then it just went on and on and on mm -hmm. in interviews he said i was just drained and then you had people mm -hmm. from comedy central and outside forces telling him how the show should be or at least in his words trying to put him in a box a little bit as far as what he should write and what he should write about technically part of dave's 50 million dollar contract was that he had creative control over the show but you know, there were more writers being hired. There were people who were surrounding him and, uh, you know, telling him, well, we should do it this way, we should do it this way. This was kind of bittersweet because, like I said, I watched it on DVD, and I think I caught up to the point where we were able to watch it mm -hmm. live, and then it wasn't anything else left until, well, Block Party came out. Block Party. 
it was Block yeah. Party, the documentary that had all those musicians that Dave Chappelle gathered. But then after season two, you start hearing these rumors that Dave Chappelle isn't happy. Dave Chappelle left the set. But word started leaking out that there were problems on the set. There was a certain kind of responsibility, you know, that he felt he had. And I think that's also where, you know, wanting to make sure he didn't lose control of his art because, as he said, in the wrong hands, this stuff could become dangerous. It could reinforce in the minds of, of our white sisters and brothers a sense of black inferiority. It also can reinforce in black people's minds a sense of black inferiority. And so I think for him, it was, let me pause. Right. And then all of a sudden, it became like, an unsolved mysteries episode because nobody knew where he was yeah yeah he vanished he completely vanished, vanished. Yeah. and it wasn't until a couple of weeks later we learned or maybe not two weeks he returned in two weeks but it wasn't until yeah. the rest of the world learned that he went to south africa yeah and just completely disappeared he went off the grid well you don't realize you're becoming a product until people start treating you like a product and I think the, the way that I was treated by people it changed so, so rapidly that I felt like the healthiest thing for me to do was to remove myself from the situation because staying in it, I wasn't crazy, but had I stayed in it longer, I would, I would probably be on this interview like... And then that's when we start learning that Dave's not happy. Dave is burnt out. And then yeah. the news media start alluding to well, what's wrong with Dave? Is he on drugs? Like, what's going on? Because why would he leave a $50 yeah. million dollar contract to go to Africa right. unless something mentally wasn't right with this guy? And during right. that time, Dave, now we know, went to South Africa because he was burnt out. He didn't like the way that things were going in Dave's words. He felt like certain entities were trying to control how he worked, when he worked and they weren't giving him enough support and in one i do remember this from back then he said during season three there was a skit he was recording for season three and in the production team they were laughing which is not uncommon yeah. but he said it was one guy who was a white guy was laughing and it just rubbed him the wrong way the story goes that a white staffer's laughter a bit too long and a bit too loud upset dave I think that that moment when he stood there literally in blackface and heard himself being laughed at by uh, a white person off camera in a way that he found offensive, that was the moment when he said, you know, I was, I was under a lot of pressure as it was, he felt, but this was it. It was definitely racially provocative, even by his own standards. Yeah, yeah. So what he said was it was like he was laughing at him and not with him. And the skit was the pixie skit because he did three pixies. He did the Latino pixie, the white pixie, and the black pixie. And the sketch was these pixies were talking to people. These were racist connotations. And <laughs> the black pixie, it was him in blackface with white lips, and he had on the conductor outfit. And he's like, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> and uh, the guy was on the plane. And the lady said, there's two entrees. You can either get the fish or the chicken. And he's like, get the chicken, you big blue bitch. Get the chicken. It's like, you know you want the chicken. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> you want to know something? Uh, I barely remember season three. Like, we're... Those are the lost takes. Those are the lost, yeah. uh, lost episodes. They titled it that. And it was hosted by Donnell Rollins and Charlie, Charlie Murphy. Murphy. The first episode, they were like, we don't want to be doing this. We don't want to be the ones that introduced the show. But, hey, we got this material. I remember them saying well, somebody has to do it. Yeah, because but... Donnell Rollins was like, I'm broke, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So where's David, man? Africa. <laughs> Africa, Africa. Yeah. I'm broke, bitch! <laughs> but we get to the end. Chappelle mm -hmm. is on this odyssey, this mental retreat to South Africa. Rumors are swirling. People are saying, oh, he must be on drugs. Oh, he's burnt out. Oh, he's freaking out. And Chappelle, after two weeks, he comes back and decides to leave the show and leave 50 million on the table because 
he wants to do things his way and we find out he doesn't have the name and likeness rights to his own brand Chappelle's show I'm pretty sure that has something to do with it he alluded to that on his stand up right. the bird revelation so it was a two parter it was equanimity and the bird revelation and in the bird revelation Dave kept teasing the audience like you all really want to know why I left my show and he kept teasing it yeah. he kept teasing it he alluded to at the end of that stand up special like he was basically being pimped yeah. by the industry and mm -hmm. they were trying to use him like they would a pimp to a whore I'm just trying to tell you what happened to me was not, it, I just didn't have a good go of it. What, I don't know what you guys think happens when you quit a successful show like this. I'll tell you what doesn't happen. They don't go, hey, well, good luck with your future endeavors. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what happens. It was cold out there. For real, I had to watch it all go down without me. I had to watch all those people do my show, Key and Peel, and Amy Schumer, and Mind them and see them. Well, I'm not going to say they were doing my show. I'm just saying they were awfully similar. I was mad. And people would come up to me on the street and be like, yo, nigga, just every once in a while. Most people thought I was crazy, but sometimes people come, yo, nigga, you did the right thing, man. You my hero. Nigga, I don't want to be your hero. I want to be rich. <laughs> Never choose to be a hero because heroes die uncomfortable deaths. At least... That's what I got from that special. And he just did not appreciate that to the point where he just wanted to blow it all up. And like I said, when he got back from South Africa, he felt hurt. From what I read, he didn't even tell his wife that he was leaving. The only person he yeah. told, he said, was his brother. He said he woke yeah. up one day and he just said, I'm not going to work. He told his brother that I'm going, but don't tell anybody. But Dave Chappelle just felt compelled to do it. And I remember at the time he felt a little hurt because he said he was hearing things that people were saying and among them was Neil Brennan. And he was yeah. like on the Oprah show, he was like, yeah, like Neil, I don't know if it's a culture thing, but it's just certain things that I was expecting for him to say and do and he didn't do it, but that might be a yeah. culture thing. And I guess he didn't think Neil Brennan had his back more publicly mm -hmm. that he thought he should have. And yeah. a counterpoint to that, and like, yeah, you can't just bounce and leave and expect my be like whoa yay man more power yeah. to you like no nah, <laughs> this is bigger than just yeah. a podcast that we're doing like yeah. we're, there's no stakes like you have yeah. people economically invested in that show and you just straight up just left and didn't tell anybody or give anybody a heads up but yeah there were warning signs so after Chappelle left the show there was season three that came out hosted by Donnell Rawlings and Charlie Murphy just to get the last episodes that they recorded for the show and then yeah. Chappelle basically went into damn near like the witness protection program you didn't see him yeah he came back to stand up but it was very quiet like he went and did like small clubs eventually mm -hmm. because for all intents and purposes after he left the show he was just pretty much done he went back to yeah. Yellow Spring Ohio and went back to a farm that he owns and yeah nobody knew that so fast forward 2013 you hear more rumblings of him starting to make a comeback and then eventually he signs with netflix to do stand-up specials and reportedly sign like a 60 million deal to do that and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden Chappelle is back and yeah. along with that as he's getting all this acclaim and becomes like the people's champ. He didn't have his likeness. He didn't have his rights, like we yeah. said. And everything that we wanted him to do, which is like come back and do the show, he was like, yo, I don't even have the rights to my show. And you do the contract game. And that's how I got with Comedy Central. I signed the contract. But I signed the contract the way that a 28-year-old expectant father that was broke signs a contract. I was desperate. I needed a way out. And it wasn't good money, and it wasn't good circumstances. But uh, what else am I going to do, I said. And all these white people sitting at that table told me, trust us, Dave, it's a good contract. People think I made a lot of money for Chappelle's show. When I left that show, I never got paid. They didn't have to pay me because I signed the contract. But is that right? 
I found out that these people were streaming my work, and they never had to ask me, or they never had to tell me. Perfectly legal, because I signed the contract. But is that right? I didn't think so either. And then he starts complaining about that to Viacom and the people that run that. And then finally, mm -hmm. Chappelle gained back his name and likeness and announced that, I believe, on Saturday Night Live and other yeah. platforms. Like, right. you guys can watch it now. Because remember, he was like, yo, don't even watch the Chappelle show because they're taking money away from me. I don't, I'm not getting anything from that. So yeah. it'll be like us doing this show and then some company buys our show and then and they get paid and they get paid we get nothing so good for him but yeah. final thoughts about the legacy of the show well i think Chappelle really opened the stage for a lot of comedians to come in and really get their feet wet in sketch comedy i feel that it borrowed a lot from in living color you know some of the ways the sketches were you know they were meant to mm -hmm. get you thinking i'm not saying that they were the same i'm just saying his method was to get you thinking it was to make you laugh like i could watch that show and i enjoy it his comedy i enjoy it, but his comedy is more to make you uncomfortable you know yeah. like it was like a social more, experiment almost yeah 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 like it's a big leap from who he was on the show to who he is now. Correct. Like, he's more engaging. He's more thought-provoking. You know, he's really doing a lot of stuff now to get you really thinking. I, I'm not going to get into, like, how he discusses his trans comedy and stuff like that. Like, that's him. I can't do that because I, I don't know how to make that funny. But Correct. He, uh, and I didn't bring it up he, because I wanted he, to just deal with the show. But Dave Chappelle, the comedian... That's a whole nother ball of wax. But as far as the show is concerned, yeah. I think it held up a mirror to society. And people like Chappelle are men's of their time that can do that. Like men's of their time that understand yes. what is going on at the time and can successfully talk about it in such mm -hmm. a way that everybody is like the 360 type of view of everything. And that's what that show represents right, right, to right. me. Everything that was going on in 2004, 2005 with the war in Iraq, like mm -hmm. important events that was happening around that time. And you get the important musical guests. Like we first see Kanye West on a national yeah. stage. We see people yes. get introduced to most deaf people get introduced to Paul Mooney for the first time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like Martin Lawrence before him and other black celebrities like i feel like once we like get a show we want to put everybody on the damn show that we yeah. love i mean yeah. i'm not saying that white people or other cultures don't do that i mean of course they want to like yeah. build up their friends but the legacy of the show i believe and i think this is true universally put a mirror to society and it continues to do so and we have our own little Chappelle moment and if yeah. you guys didn't see the Instagram live, which by the way, every Friday, 6.30 Eastern time, you can catch us Instagram live, 6.30. Yesterday, I made a big show announcement. And as you can tell, one of the hosts is not on this episode, which is our brother, our friend, Aaron, who yeah. decided after two, two and a half years, I don't know, we started this, podcast in, in the, the summer, summer of uh, 2020 yeah during the height of the pandemic just a way to just you know keep in touch with each other and right you know entertain each other and then it became something else but aaron moving forward won't be on the show i know that's sad but we love aaron to death to, to death, death and, man. and to be quite frank it's more of a personal journey for him you know like it's not like he was tired of the show or anything like that. He just needs a break, uh, like I did when I stepped away for school. Yeah. Real life happens, and sometimes you have to take a step away because we put this stuff out for you all. We enjoy talking to each other. I mean, we talk to each other anyway, but we put this stuff out for you all 
And sometimes we have to take a step back for our families, for our, our mental health. So it's kind of important that we do things like that. And this is what he's doing right now. But John, really you can say to... it. He totally Dave chappelle us. He went yeah. and got his Africa ticket and he abandoned yeah. the show. And we he went to South Africa and to spend some time amongst his people. Yes, and, uh, to start uh, his cult in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. To, do apartheid again. No, I'm kidding. He didn't do yeah. that. <laughs> do his Jim Jones, yeah. have people drink yeah. the Kool-Aid. But yeah, he yeah, kind of so he kind of left us hanging. It's like, I feel like yeah. Darnell Rollins or Charlie Murphy, like, yo, I don't want to be doing this. Like, why do I have to be the mediator? Why do I have to, like, start the yeah. show saying... It's not the same. It's like losing a lamb. It's not the same without him around. So we want to make sure that he knows that and that the doors will always be open. The only marathon man here is Double D. He's been here. He's the Cal Ripken of the <laughs> podcast world. <laughs> the black Cal Ripken. But obviously the show yeah. is going to change a little bit. It's going to be a little bit more focused on, what would you say, John? Uh, black stuff? I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to be black stuff. exploring some stuff. Ironically, black. how we went these last couple episodes, black. it may look like we're extending Black History Month, but that's not <laughs> the case. We uh, Darkness, everybody. It just so happens we're talking about some vintage stuff from back in the day, because the next episode is going to be on a show that I like, a family that I like, the Waynes Brothers. We're going to talk about them, specifically Sean and Marlon, because they had a fantastic cast. John Witherspoon played their father on the from show. From Detroit. Yep, and Maria Horsford play Sweet D. Steve. She was the uh, the security guard on there. And then they had a lot of other people from different movies. But yeah. those are some of the topics that we'll be covering now that yeah. the white man isn't here. And we can <laughs> finally get some words in because, you know, Aaron's just yeah. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. Bre breathing all the white man's air. Anyway. <laughs> this is the After School Special Podcast. Look us up on Instagram, After School Special Podcast. Yep. Look us up on YouTube, After School Special Podcast. Twitter, After School SPE3 on Twitter. TikTok, After School Special 3. After School Special 3. We're also on Speak Pipe. That's where you can leave us a voicemail for the show. It's called Speak Pipe. And our handle on there is Latchkey Kids Speak. So if you click, because we have a link in the description of our episodes. We use Buzzsprout as our hosting agent. So if you go onto our episode description, you can find that link on there. Is there another one that I'm missing? We're on Facebook, um, but nobody goes on Facebook. We're, we are on Facebook, but yeah. just to add on to that, we do live stream every Friday yeah. on Instagram. I'm not sure how we're going to do this Friday because I am going to Michigan to hang oh, out with these guys. Oh, another big yeah. announcement. Yeah, so I will be in Michigan with my buddies. So uh, I will be there with them, Aaron and Don. We also want to make sure to mention that we will be trying to live stream on TikTok. You yeah. Know, yeah, we heard through the grapevine that TikTok seems to be the better place to live stream. So we're going to try and push as much content out. So we're trying to do as much social media as we can to get ourselves flowing and, and get things out. So yeah, look for us on Instagram Live on Fridays, eventually on TikTok. Our Probably Instagram lives are recorded, by the way, and yeah. you can catch those lives that you missed if you go to our Instagram account and you can catch all of them. It's on our Instagram account. So if you missed it, but after school special podcast, that's staff, man, I'm double D. We'll catch yes. you the next time. Retro history, all of those great things that we love and we'll talk about relevant things that is happening now that connects with our past and i think that's yeah. the glue that holds the show together it's fun to look back but it's also fun to look forward but you can't have a future without the past you can't have the present without history so yeah we will see you see you the next time latchkey kids broken homies peace out peace out Hey everyone, it's Aaron from After School Special Podcast. Like what you hear so far? But don't forget to subscribe and download the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And 
Just a friendly reminder, we have new episodes out every Friday. Thanks for listening, everyone. But obviously, the show yeah. is going to change a little bit. It's going to be a little bit more focused on, what would you say, John? Uh, black stuff? I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to be black exploring stuff. some 